Loving Father of mercy and compassion, may your spirit lead us, O Lord, in this presentation. We plead with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Greetings, brothers and sisters, colleagues and friends. I'm Kuza, your host, and this is the Herald Report Ministry. We are very grateful for this opportunity. God has commissioned all of us to go for him, to go with the gospel of the everlasting to all the world. We are to use our talents. We are to use our gifts. We are to use our influence. Uh, to our influence for the salvation of our neighbors, for the salvation of our family, for the salvation of others. And the call to gospel is a call to responsibility. We have souls to win and we also have souls to lose. Christianity is all about living for others rather than ourselves. As we are in this world, brothers and sisters, Jesus has left responsibility for us. He would have commissioned the angels, but he did send me and you and empowered me and you with the gift of the Holy Spirit that we may go and deliver this truth and rescue those who are perishing in sin. The Bible says in the book of John chapter 20, 21, then say Jesus to them again, peace be unto you as my father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he has said this, he breathes on them and say unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Brothers and sisters, when it comes to witnessing, we need to be empowered by the gift of the Holy Spirit. There is one thing that we need to understand in that scripture. The first thing is that God has sent us. Jesus has sent us to represent him. The next thing is that he did not send us empty-handed, but he gave us the power of the Holy Spirit so that when we share his gospel, then our work will have fruits. Now we are told in manuscript release 44, 18, 95, there is a great work to be done for every son and daughter of God. Now if there is a great work to be done, what is this work to be done? If there is a great work, if the work is great, brothers and sisters, then it calls for preparation. It calls for planning. It calls for investment. Because the work is great, you cannot afford just to do it anyhow. You need to plan on how to execute this great work. It says, our Savior prayed not only for his apostles, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That was his prayer in John chapter 17. We are expected to bear a definite, as definite a testimony of the truth as it is in Jesus as the apostles did. If we do this trusting in the efficacy, efficiency of the Holy Spirit, the darkness will be dispelled from many minds and many voices will be heard testifying of the mercy, goodness and love of a crucified and risen Savior. So this is what will happen as we go and do this work, brothers and sisters, uh, with sincerity, empowered by the gift of the Holy Spirit. We'll see the results of this work. Remember, this is a great work. And this great work, you cannot leave it for someone to do it for you. You are to do this great work based on the gifts which God has given you. We're told that is. And he also says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I'll pray the Father and he'll give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said, I go to my father, for my father is greater than I. That's taken from John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 28. What's so special about this first prayer, sisters? Jesus has commissioned his church to go. As he has commissioned his church to go, he empowers his church by the gift of the Holy Spirit. But the gift of the Holy Spirit will only come to the obedient church. Now, the emission of Jesus Christ is impossible to be done without obedience to his commandments, without him being empowered by the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then John chapter 14, verse 11, the last mission meeting Jesus had with his disciples before the cross, the Bible says, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Then if Jesus promised that we are going to do greater work, how are we going to do this greater work? I want you to understand this, brothers and sisters. Jesus left heaven. He invested everything in this work and he did this work diligently. 
And then he says, greater things you are going to do. For I have commissioned you to do this great work. Then it calls for time. It calls for planning. It calls for investment. It calls for a diligent thought on how you can execute this work. Evangelism is not an afterthought. Evangelism is not something that I do on my spare time. Evangelism is something which I plan to do for. There is no other work which is greater than the work of evangelism. You know, I meet quite a number of people as I talk and I say, well, I'm a preacher. And sometimes I make this, uh, uh, this expression that, you know, I preach, uh, that, that's what I do. And uh, I, uh, sometimes I take it as if it's, when I talk to them, I take it as if it's casual. And then the response is that, you know what? There is no greater work than the preaching of the gospel. There is no greater work than saving a soul. There is no greater work than saving a soul eternally, uh, for eternity. You know, brothers and sisters, I've worked as a nurse in an emergency department. And I've done a lot of, re I've participated in a lot of resuscitations. And I've also participated in major incidents, major incidents where we try to save as much life as possible, where we deal with people who are in a critical state. That was a commendable job. I, 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 I enjoyed it. And I recommend to those who want to do that line, please, may the Lord bless you. It's a very wonderful job to do. But now listen, there is no greater work than giving someone salvation. Yes, we are to give life to someone means for survival is an entering wage, but there is no greater work than giving someone salvation. For that reason, if we go to school, we spend four years, three years study nursing so that we can save life in the hospital. How much more preparation should we do to save someone for eternal, for eternal, for eternal life? Now listen to what it says, John chapter 14, 13, And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If we are going to ask anything in the name of Jesus, that, and he said he's going to do it, remember the context is in the preaching of the gospel. There is no limitation in what we can do. So he has called me to preach the gospel. He has called you to preach the gospel and to represent him. Therefore, what you need... What I need are the equipments to equip me to be able to do that job. How am I going to do it unless he has given me power? And now he say, all power has been given unto me. And he say, whatsoever you ask in my name, I will do it. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in the work of the preaching of this gospel, there is no limitation to what we can do as long as we are in Christ Jesus. You know, these days people are tired of theory. They would want practical. But now let me actually read the quotation and then we'll go to something else. Desire of Age, page 64, paragraph 4 says, Very, very, I say unto you, Christ continued, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. The Savior was deeply anxious for his disciples to understand for what purpose his divinity was united, uh, was united to humanity. He came to the world to display the glory of God that he might be uplifted by the restoring power. So as Jesus was talking, his divinity is being reflected. This is a final meeting and the disciples could see that there is something very special on Jesus today. And then it says, God was manifested in him that he might be manifested in them. Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him. His perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess if they will be in subjection to God as he was. So when we are in subjection to God as Jesus was, there is no limitation to what we can do in the preaching of the gospel. All what we need to do is we need to plan seriously and we need to execute seriously. And the power of the Holy Spirit has been promised. He will empower us until we finish the work. It says, the Savior promised to his disciples the Savior's promise to his disciples is a promise to his church to the end of time. God did not design that his faithful, his wonderful plan to redeem men should achieve only insignificant results. In other words, uh, the plan of God is that, is that his, his work or his promise will produce very big results. 
it says that uh, God did not design that his wonderful plan to redeem men should achieve only insignificant results. No. The plan of God is that his plan will produce much bigger result. There will not be any limitation. That's why all power has been invested in there. All resources have been invested in there. And he said, all who will go to work trusting not in what they themselves can do, but in what God can do for and through them, we will certainly realize the fulfillment of his promise. Greater works than this shall he do. Shall he do, he declares, because I go to my father. You know, Jesus is promising that we can do much greater work because he has gone to the father. Now, how great is great work? And how are we to do this work? Now, listen, brothers and sisters, it's important to realize that in the work of evangelism, you don't work on your own. In the work of evangelism, you work with many people. Some of the people you may work with, you know them. Some of the people you do not know them. God knows how to position his people for the right, on the, for the right work at the right time. You know, Paul gave this analogy. He was talking about him and Apollos and what was happening in Corinth. You realize that some people will sow the seeds. Some people will water the seeds. Some people will cultivate the crop as they grow. And some people will harvest and after all, it's God that gives the increase. Now, how does that happen? Now, listen to what Paul says. First Thessalonians, First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave increase. Now, so he said, Paul has planted, Apollos then watered. But when it comes to the increase, it was God who did it. Now, brothers and sisters, what actually that means is, I'm not sure which part are you going to play. He said that the, the one who is going to plant Oh, yeah, the one who is going to water. But remember, it's God that will give the increase. And then it says, uh, So then neither is he that planted anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. So we have been all been called and been gifted differently and we've been commissioned to work in the vineyard of God. And at the end of the day, God will give us a reward of what we have done. Our salvation depends upon how serious we take the work that he has given us. Because Christ's object, Lexington page 388 says, Upon your faithfulness in this work, not only the well-being of others, but your own eternal destiny depends. Christ is seeking to uplift all who will be lifted to companionship with himself that we may be one with him and he is one as is one with the Father so that we can be united and work together with Christ for our salvation depends upon how serious we take the work of God. And as we go to heaven, brothers and sisters, we are told that we cannot enter heaven unless there is somebody who have influenced there for heaven. Because Daniel chapter 12 verse 3 says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars of forever and ever. They that turn many to righteousness. What then does this mean, brothers and sisters? How has been my influence for the salvation of others? How did I contribute to the preaching of the everlasting gospel? Because there will not be any starless crown in heaven. How has been your contribution? Were you the one who was singing for the evangelist? Were you the one who was reading the Bible? Were you the one to go to door to door knocking? Were you the one to lead in the Bible studies? Were you the one to preach? Were you the one to sustain those who were doing the work? Every one of us has a work to do. Every one of us will enter heaven only because there is somebody in heaven who is there because of their influence. And the Bible says they that turn many to righteousness will have loads of crowns. And there will not be any starless crown in heaven. Now listen to uh, Signs of the Times, June 6, 1892. Yet there will be no one saved in heaven with a starless crown. 
If you enter, there will be some saw in the courts of glory that is found an entrance there through your instrumentality. Then why not entreat the Lord to put upon you his spirit that you may be able to awaken an interest in the truth in the minds of those around you. Think of your neighbors, your friends, your relatives who are out of Christ. Brothers and sisters, how is our influence? How wonderful it is for you to organize a meeting for your relatives, for your friends, for your family to listen to the gospel. How wonderful it is for you to organize an evangelistical campaign in your village that your relatives and friends can go and be saved. How blessed it is for you to take time to pray for your loved ones who are grounded in sin that God can rescue them. For there will not be any starless crown in heaven. Our responsibility, our salvation depends on how we execute our responsibilities. Now it says, think of those who have left in various foreign lands. How much do you care for their souls? Those who have left in foreign lands, when you have traveled and probably you are in diaspora, how are you helping those in your neighborhood? who do not have access to Bibles like you, who do not have access to the book Great Controversy. You know, I mean, this place, Zimbabwe, there's not even one printing company for the Great Controversy. No, not at all. Everything is imported here. If there is a printing company, I don't know where it is. The Bibles, I know they are printed in India. They, they bring them here. Now, here it is. Inspiration is saying, think about how you care for the souls, those who have left in your country. Here, the great controversy is $3. Now, look at this. <coughs> Excuse me. You should be so filled with love for the lost that you cannot forbear working for the salvation of souls. What can I do to be filled with the love of the souls? Remember, two weeks ago, we spoke about John Knox, the man that prayed to God that give me souls. Give me Scotland or else I die. What's your responsibility? What's your desire? Our Christianity is inadequate. If we just think of the cars that we want to drive, we think of the dresses that we want to put on, we think of the hairstyles that we want to have, we think of the food that we want to eat, but now, what happened to those that need salvation on your neighborhood? It's your responsibility, brothers and sisters. This is what Jesus is saying here to us. He says, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst him. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. In the rich blessing of Jesus is in your, if the rich blessing of Jesus is in your hearts, you will be able to refresh others. You know, this is the most, this is one of the most interesting verses I, I read in the Bible. When Jesus is talking about the wellspring of life in us. Because if the wellspring of life is in us, then we want to go and refresh others. We want to go and cool others. We want to share this water with others. But what is this all about? Now, if you take it from the book of John chapter 4, verse 18, the Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall be thirst, shall thirst. Now, Jesus is talking to a woman of Samaria at the well. He has asked for water and she's not willing to give him water. And now he is offering her the real water. Now verse 14 says, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So if I give you this water, this is what Jesus is saying. This is, there will be a well in you that will spring into everlasting life. Now, John chapter 7 then give us an understanding of what Jesus is talking about. Verse 38, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So when we believe in Jesus Christ, out of our bellies 
who flow rivers of waters. And what is this all about? John was very kind to give us a better understanding of this. Verse 39. By this spake ye of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Yes, so the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And as Jesus was glorified, then he sent the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he, as he sent the Holy Spirit, he empowered his disciples. Now look at what happened as he was glorified in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended upon high, he led it captivity captive and gave gifts unto all men. So as he went into heaven, glorified after the cross, he gave gifts to all men. Verse 9, now that he ascended, what is it, it but that he also descended first unto the lower parts of the earth? He that ascended is the same also that, he that descended is the same also that ascended up for far above all the heaven, that he might fill all, he might fill all things. So how is he going to fill all things? Brothers and sisters, this is the most interesting thing. Because he is going to fill all things. But uh, how is that going to happen? Do you know, brothers and sisters, the verse, same chapter then says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the work of Christ, till we come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. So as he ascended, he empowered us all by the gift of the Holy Spirit. He gave us these gifts, which are different. And then as he sent us, he sent us with all these gifts to go and win souls for him. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 4 says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit without. So now, if he has given everyone that we may profit, if he has empowered everyone, that we may all benefit, what has he given you? You realize that, you know, the book of 1 Corinthians give us a list, gave us a list of different gifts, but they were all given by the same Spirit. Let me go to verse 11. But all this worketh that one and the same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will for as the body is one and has many members and all the members of that body being many are one body so also is christ so we are many members in the body if you remember last week when we were talking about regular and irregular line we use some of these verses and this quotation he said the lord has not qualified any one of us to bear the burden of the work alone he has associated together men of different minds that they may counsel with and assist one another. In this way, the deficiency in the experience and abilities of one is supplied by the experience and abilities of another. We should all study carefully the instruction given in Corinthians and Ephesians regarding our relation to one another as members of the body. Brothers and sisters, I actually realized that uh, I will not be able to do the work on my own. I depend on God. And I realized the best that we can do is to have a team. For we are of different strength. For we need each other in the gospel. We experience different challenges. But in these challenges, we can empower one another. We started the radio ministry last week. Uh, this is uh, in the central uh, Zimbabwe conference. Basically, it's the central in the central Zimbabwe, not Zimbabwe conference, but in the central Zimbabwe, the central Midland, Midlands, um, Midlands radio. And as we do that work, I'm responsible for preaching. Somebody is responsible for financing, but I cannot preach on my own. I need a team to work with me. 
Now this team needs transportation. There are many logistics that needs to take place. And not one person can does, do that on his own. I rely on many different people to ensure that that work is done. What am I saying, brothers and sisters? When God has given you a task, you are not going to do it on your own. You may do it on your own, but you need the help and assistance of others. As we have read from the book of 1 Corinthians, one is a hand, one is a leg, one is an ear, one is a mouth. The people that have, we have worked with when we were doing Classic 260 Radio, we worked with people in England, we worked with people in Australia, we worked with people in South Africa, we worked with people in America, we worked with people in Zimbabwe, we worked with people all over the world. It was a big task. We still have a big, big task to do. But I actually realized that um, God has given me strength to preach. But others have been given strength to, uh, to get resources. Others work as advisors. Others work as assistants. Others, we do many different things and we complement each other. Brothers and sisters, as we covered last week, when we look at the work of God, sometimes there are challenges. And the challenge is others want to control this work. Others want to be in charge of this work. Others want to man manipulate and monopolize this work. The work of God does not work that way. If you remember the story of the uh, Pharisees in the book of Acts chapter 4, 6, the Bible says, And as the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexandra and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem and when they had set them in their midst, they asked by what power or by what name have you done this? Now, this was a question which was asked by the priests to the apostles. God had given them power. God had given them authority. God had given them the Holy Spirit. And they were now doing the work of God. And the work was not small. The work was so great. And the question was, well, who has commissioned you? Why are you doing something we have not discussed? Why are you doing something that we have not authorized you to do? You know, inspiration actually said the Pharisees, they thought themselves competent to decide who sh sh should preach the gospel. They thought themselves competent to teach somebody who is supposed to preach the gospel. Now, they did not understand that these apostles, they were being led by the Holy Spirit. They were educated in the school of Christ. They knew what to do. To them, that, doesn't, that it was nothing. They wanted everything to come through them. Brothers and sisters, in the vineyard of God, we have got souls to win and souls to lose. What is the responsibility which God has given you? Think about the people that you can team up with. We have got different gifts. For gifts are not the same, but they are all given by the gift of the Holy Spirit. And as we come together, brothers and sisters, we can actually say to ourselves, God says, if we believe in him, we are going to do great tasks. As we believe in God, what are we planning to do? You know, one of the things that we've decided to do is we run a prison ministry. In the prison ministry, as we set our goal, I actually say to myself, I live two kilometers, one and a half to two kilometers from prison. And I say to myself, in fact, it's less than two kilometers. God has given me this opportunity. Let me ensure that every prisoner is a copy of the great controversy. For me to have access to prison, the officers will say, you can't come here without a donation. Those people, they want food. They want clothing. Now, there is something I have. I have my voice. I have my strength. But I don't have food to give them. I want to give them books. I don't have those gifts to give them. Now, my friend said to me, you have a plan. In your plan, Chikogora, I'm going to give you, I'm going to contribute 2,500 for this plan to work. And then another friend of mine says, 
you have shared your plan. In your plan, I will ensure that at least you have got 500 great controversies regularly that this work may move. And now this other colleague has called, want to send books. And they actually sent about 800 great controversies and also socks. And now this other colleague said to me, we are going to give you 500 great controversies. And the other colleague then says, I'm going to add 300. And this other colleague says, I'm going to put some money. And there's another colleague who I don't know, they've put some money in there, I don't know where they are, but I pray that God will continue to bless them. So now, as we look at the mission, that which was difficult has become very possible in that uh, many people have chipped in to move the work of God. But now we are not going to stop there. We have decided to change our plans. Not change, but to modify our plans. Because the verse says, greater works than this you will do. Now, if we are going to do greater work, how are we going to influence many people? You know, I'm in the country where many people, they don't even know what the Great Controversy is all about. They don't know the book Great Controversy. They've never seen them. They've never seen the book. Many people are baptized in church. They've never touched the Great Controversy. Many people have been members in church for a long time, but they do not have access to the Great Controversy. Initially, I was saying I want at least 3,500 Great Controversies for maximum prison. But last week, uh, as I was going to the maximum prison, I met an elder for, uh, for another church which is next door to me. Uh, it's a church at support unit there, very big church. In that place, there are over, there are thousands and thousands of people. And as we begin to discuss, he said, you know what? We have managed to acquire at least 150 great controversies. So we have already given 150 great controversies. That's a big achievement. And as we discussed, I actually said to myself, if we can acquire a thousand great controversies, and we ensure that every police officer has a copy of a great controversy. Now, I don't have the great controversies, but I sincerely believe that uh, together with you and me, we can ensure that every police officer, in addition to the prisoners, in addition to the prison officers, has a copy of the great controversy. There are those on the ground who share the books. But there are those far away who can get the books for us. And when the books are in our hands, we share them. Now, when we get to heaven, all of us who have crowns, and in our crowns there will be stars, for the work that we have worked together, to ensure that those who do not know this truth have the truth. As I preach on the radio, now I'm preaching on two stations, on Yangani FM and uh, Central Radio, I say to people, I can get you a copy of a great controversy. I've got a PDF on my phone. I can send that to you. But those, there are those who need the actual copy. I've got some copies with me, but they are coming and going very quickly. And I pray that God will give us much more. And we share this book that everybody who needs the copy of the Great Controversy here in Zimbabwe, who have the copy of the Great Controversy. How are we going to do it? Jesus promised that whatsoever we ask in his name, he's going to do it. Now, brothers and sisters, you realize that, you know, this is the task that God has given us. And we want to do this task. And as we want to do this task, we work together with many different people. In your vicinity where you are, what has God given you? How are you going to do your mission? Do you know, brothers and sisters, if we are going to be waiting for the church to do this mission for us, we are missing the point. What I've actually realized is that uh, the church is planning, but they don't have that plan for a mass distribution of the great conference. If they have the plan, in this conference which I am in, I, I am in here, they don't have the resources for that. Because the great controversy costs $3. Do 
But of course, in another place, the great conference costs only a dollar or even less than a dollar. To such people, people find it easy to share because it's easier to get. But over here is hard. But now let me come to this point as we begin to wind down. We are all gift gifted differently. And it's God that empowers us with the wisdom to plan. It's God that has called us for a mission which can only be done by us. Remember last week we spoke about the regular and irregular lines. And we looked at the life of John the Baptist. That he was called as the second Elijah to go and preach the gospel. And he, he was given the power in the Holy Spirit. The spirit of Elijah, as Luke chapter 117 says, to bring revival to Israel. And as he was bring, bring, going with this mission, he was a layman. Yes, greater than the prophet indeed. But he was controlled by God himself. His mission was directed by God himself. What am I saying, brothers and sisters? While the church is planning, which is very important, but God has individuals which he has also commissioned to complement what the church is doing. That's why the church is a regular line. And John the Baptist was an irregular line. And he was qualified. He was given the qualification by God. He was trained by God himself to do the work of preparation. We are told in the book Desire of Ages, page 453, all wondered at his knowledge of the, the law and the prophecies and the question passed from one to another. How knowest this man letters having never learned? No one was regarded as qualified to be a religious teacher unless he had studied in the rabbinical schools and both Je Jesus and John the Baptist had been represented as, ig has been represented as ignorant because they had not received this training, of course, they were regarded as ignorant. But who did greater work than Jesus? Who did greater work than John the Baptist apart from Jesus? He says, those who heard them were astonished at their knowledge of the scripture, having never learned of men they had not truly, but God of heaven was their teacher, and from him they had received the highest kind of wisdom. That's the Zion of Ages, page 453. What we need, brothers and sisters, is the highest kind of wisdom from God. And we need to believe by faith. Him giving us the Holy Spirit. And there's no limitation in what we can do. I think of uh, the people who run this program called uh, the 3 ABN. I've listened to them. I've read some of the books they read, they, they wrote. And I actually realize that all what we need is to believe by faith. And greater works than what Jesus did, we will be able to do them. And what we need, it's a training that we receive from God. And this training comes as we submit to God. After all, brothers and sisters, there is no hierarchy in the preaching of the gospel. We are all the same. You know, it says that in the natural order of things, the son of the, uh, Zacharias would have been educated for the priesthood, but the training of the rabbinical school would have unfitted him for his work. God did not send him to, be, to the teachers of the theology to learn how to interpret the scripture. He called him to the desert that he might learn of the nature and nature's God. So all of us could be trained by God. All of us could be empowered by God. All of us, we could be called and then we are equipped to do the work that God and God alone can empower us to do. What we need is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the promise of John X chapter 1 verse 8 says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You will be my witnesses when we have received the power. But how do we obtain this power? 
When we pray, brothers and sisters, we are to pray using the scripture, claiming the promise of the scripture. For the Bible says in the book of Luke chapter 11, verse 18, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Let's ask the gift of the Holy Spirit that God may empower us and we'll be able to share the truth. That God may empower us that we may be able to plan. That God may empower us that we may be able to focus on our plan for the work that God has called us for to do. It's a great work. It needs planning. It needs resources. It needs cooperation. It needs teamwork. It needs total surrender to God. And indeed, we'll be successful. Desire of Ages, page 672. Christ has promised a gift of the Holy Spirit to his church. And the promise belongs to us as much as to the first disciples. But like every other promise, it is given on conditions. There are many who believe and profess to claim the Lord's promise. They talk about Christ and about the Holy Spirit, yet receive not benefits. I ask myself a question, and I want to pose this question to you. Have you received the gift of the Holy Spirit? If you have received the Holy Spirit, what is the evidence? Because the promise that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, has he, the Spirit of truth, come upon you? And what do we need most? Brothers and sisters, uh, in fact, before I come to this, I want to go to this statement. Say, they do not surrender the soul to be guided and controlled by the divine agencies. We cannot use the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is to use us. Through the Spirit, God works in his people to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's Philippians chapter 2, 13. But men will not submit to this. They want to manage themselves. This is why they do not receive the heavenly gift. Am I be able to surrender? Can I be able to surrender so that I don't manage myself, but the Holy Spirit leads me? This is a call of God, brother and sister, that we may be able to surrender all to Jesus. Is it possible to surrender myself to be under the control of the power of God? It says only to those who wait humbly upon God, who watch for his guidance and grace, is the spirit given. The power of God awaits their demand and reception. This promised blessing claimed by faith brings all other blessing in its train. It is given according to the riches of the grace of Christ, and he's, he is ready to supply every soul according to the capacity to receive. So, when I have received the gift of the Holy Spirit, I have received all other gifts. Do I want money? I need the Holy Spirit first. Do and I, I want health? I need the gift of the Holy Spirit first. Do I want a job? I need the gift of the Holy Spirit first. When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will come as a train with all the other gifts. You know, as I studied this quotation, I think I've understood it. I actually realized that my job is to go and the resources will meet me on the way. As the Lord has given me the Holy Spirit. You know, when we started doing our classic 263 program on the radio, we didn't have anything. But the budget was 24,000. 24,000 US dollars. And for that year, we managed to do that. God provided. And I thank God for those that worked with us. I preached they provided resources. May the Lord bless them indeed. When we started prison ministry, I didn't have anything. I spoke to those guys, and then I went into the forest to pray. And from the time we started until today, we have distributed more than a thousand great controversy. And by the end of June, we would have distributed more than 2,000. 
if not more than 2,000. God is good. And now we've started another program on the radio. Over the years, I've realized the importance since 2019. In fact, was it 2019 or 2020? 2019. This is a quotation that has guided me. We too must have time set apart for meditation and prayer and for receiving spiritual refreshing. We do not value the power and efficacy of prayer as we should. Prayer and faith will do what no power on earth can accomplish. Prayer and faith will do what no power on earth can accomplish. What is your call? What is your mission? Listen, my brothers and sisters. Prayer and faith will do what no power on earth can do accomplish. I say to myself, in fact, let me say, brothers and sisters, let's plan to spend all night in prayers. Let's plan to pray. And when you plan to pray, to pray, let's implement the plan. Let's plan the work of God. This is a great work. And when we plan it, let's set aside the quality time to execute this work. For God has called us and he's powered us in this mission. And he said we are in a team with him. And not only with him, but with all of his followers of like-minded. We have been convicted with this gospel. Let's join the team. Let's work together. And we'll see what God will do. For such a time as this, he has called us for. To destroy the work of the evil one. By uplifting, uplifting the present truth of the time. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, blessed be your name. We plead with you that, Lord, we may be able to work together with you to use our gifts to the glorification of your name, that many people may come to the knowledge of the truth in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you. I look forward to see you on Friday as we'll be looking at the book of Revelation chapter 7. Until then, continue to be strong in the Lord. Please share the message. Let me hear your thoughts. Let me hear your thinking. God bless.